Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Waxahachie, Texas. To those of you I have not yet met, and to those of you with whom I am not yet familiar online, my name is Kevin Tully. I'm pastor here, and we welcome you to this service of worship. Thank you so much for making this a priority at this beginning of this brand new week. Um, want to say hello to those worshiping with us online. We know that uh, during the summertime, we have an increased online presence because there are, are members of our church that are on vacation or away from us, and uh, they tune in, whether concurrently with while the service is happening, in live action format, or reviewing it in at some later time. Uh, we just want to say hi. Hope your travelers, your travels are going well. Uh, God's blessing upon you and through you while you travel. We look forward to having you back with us. Um, we also want to encourage everyone, uh, especially the, the guests who are with us, let us know how to help you. Take that next step in your spiritual journey. If you've never been baptized, I'd love to visit with you about what baptism is, what it means. Uh, what it symbolizes. If you haven't yet found a church home, we believe you're supposed to have a church home. Might be here, might be at another place, but if you've been coming back here, we'd love to tell you more about what your being a part of this congregation would mean for you and for us. We find fulfillment in that sort of commitment, so I want to encourage you to think about it. And now, just before we begin, uh, before I, I pause and we listen to this morning's worship uh, uh, prelude, I want to share with you um, something that's happened to me spiritually over the last uh, maybe several weeks now, although it, it, it may have been building up for a couple of months. Uh, and uh, if you can relate to it, um, I hope you will. I felt God leading me to share it with you this morning. This past week, I've had a sort of a spiritual renewal and a spiritual rebirth, and it came through remembering something that I'm embarrassed to say I had forgotten or lost track of. And the thing I had forgotten or lost track of was God's command to not be afraid. Voices in the media, news on the airwaves, troubles in the church, beyond the church, internationally, uh, international wars and crises. These are not insignificant, but I had found myself being sapped in terms of my energy, my attention, and as I somehow lost faith that God was going to work things out, my own anxiety grew. I'm grateful to have remembered those simple words that guide us. God is in his holy temple. Things are going to be okay. And in the meantime, God is with us. Do not fear. Let's keep it in mind as we worship together today. Thank you for being here.
your head you then shall know shall feel your sins forgive and disobey your heavenly law and all that love is there. we're encouraged in second corinthians that even though our bodies may be breaking down our inner selves are renewed day by Day. Would you please offer an encouraging word to the person next to you? Pass a piece of Christ. be seated. Good morning, people of God. Be not afraid. Our senior pastor has reminded you, be not afraid. Would you be in an attitude of prayer as we pray together? God of grace and God of love, you are the creator of the stars, the planets, the earth, and all living things. We give you thanks for who you are. You are the one who comforts us in distress, who walks with us as we struggle with issues in our daily lives. You're the one who guides us, loves us, and will ultimately judge us. It is not up to me or to another person to place that burden upon others. Lord, in the midst of our daily lives, I pray that you, Lord God, give me compassion you grant me mercy. You bestow upon me the ability to see your love, even in those with whom I disagree. Move me. Nudge me. Guide me to draw closer to you, Lord God, because you never abandon us or cut us off from you. You and only you are God, and I am a grateful person created by you to be in your love and your service. And now with the confidence of those who love the Lord, let us now pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. me 
I would invite the ushers to now come forward. And if you all will be in an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, you are the God of abundance, the maker of the universe, the giver of life and love of creation and the created. And we come today with open hearts that display our love to you, your son, Jesus Christ, and the wonder working power of the Holy Spirit. These gifts we give back to you to do the work of the church, not just church work. Let these heartfelt gifts and tithes and offerings that we lovingly and freely give make a difference in the lives of those who may not know you, Lord Jesus. Use these gifts so that others will come to know Christ's mercy and love and the world will be changed so that Christ will be known in the hearts of all we encounter. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
our hymn of preparation is Spirit of God. You'll find the words printed in your bulletin. Let's remain standing as we sing. morning. Today's reading is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, and verses 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment, and if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. May God bless the reading, hearing, and receiving of these words. Be Please be seated. Thank you, Amelia Crumpton, for the reading.
there's a story in John's gospel about Jesus one day healing an invalid man near the pool of Bethsaida. The pool of Bethsaida, it was in the old city of Jerusalem. This man had been lying by the pool daily for many years. It was believed that an angel would come and stir up the waters. And whoever managed to get into the pool first after this occurred would be healed. Jesus came to that location one day and he saw the man and he asked him a very interesting question. He asked, do you want to be made well? The man explained that he couldn't ever seem to get into the water first because there was no one there to help him. But apparently Jesus didn't think that the magical water was necessary because he told the man to take up his pallet, the pallet he laid on, and to stand up and walk. And he did. He was healed without having to get into the pool. It's a wonderful story. It's a fantastic miracle. And it's such an interesting question. Jesus looked at a man who was, obviously, who was obviously in need, who sitting at this location seems to want healing, and he asks him, do you want to be made well? As we begin this morning's sermon, would you join me in a moment of prayer? Oh, Lord, you've promised to be among us when we gather in this manner in a special way. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit would use me and open our hearts and minds, that you would give to all of us whatever it is you want to give us. For the sake of Jesus Christ in, among, and through us, I pray. Amen. In my work as a pastor, I've learned that there are some significant differences in the needs of people who might come to my office and need to talk about something. Now, every situation and every person and couple and family is unique, of course. Um, but as folks come to talk about a difficult circumstances, a stance, a crisis, uh, a relationship issue, problems, um, I've noted that there, they can be generally lumped into two categories. Uh, one I would call problem solving, and the other one I would liken a little more closely to what we know as psychotherapy, all right, or spiritual formation. Now, in general, when a person comes in, uh, for some help with problem solving, they have a situation that they want to deal with, and when they learn what to deal with it, they go and hopefully um, they enact what they've learned, and they take care of it, and it's done. We do a lot of problem solving as a church staff. We not only report on the calendar and talk about what's coming up, but we share a lot of information. We ask a lot of questions for one another. Has, does anyone ever have any, has, has anyone had any experience with this? Uh, I'm looking for a person who might be able to help with this sort of thing. Um, what's the history of this in our church? I'm thinking about starting it. Have we ever had it before? That sort of thing. So we offer one another suggestions and articles and resources, uh, that sort of thing. Um, that's problem solving. In therapy, a person comes in with what we would call the presenting problem. It might be a circumstance, a situation, a spiritual condition, a series of confessions about sins, all that sort of thing. Uh, but if in this case they really want to be made well, 
they enter into a process. This isn't something that is fixed with a few words after a 60-minute session. They are invited to go deeper than just figuring out what to do about this present situation. Um, it's the difference between a woman coming in and saying, what can I say or do to keep my husband from hitting me? And on the other hand, coming in and being willing to explore, why do I keep putting up with a man who hits me? It's the difference between someone saying, can you help me stop telling lies to people? And on the other hand, asking, can you help me figure out why I feel the need to tell lies? Or where I got the idea that telling lies is somehow acceptable or good. Today we're continuing with this summertime series of sermons in which we're focusing on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The teachings found in the Sermon on the Mount are so wonderful and important, and important because in these teachings, Jesus tells us how we are supposed to live. In today's reading, we see that he wants us to not only obey his teachings, do the things, but for these teachings to sink deep, to shape us so that our behavior, our outward behavior, is the reflection of deeper healing in our minds, in our memories, in our hearts, and in our soul. He invites us to deal with the sources of our problems and sins. Last week I said something that um, is right, and I want to make sure you hear it on more than one occasion, so I'm going to repeat it for you now. Um, I stated what, what I said was my highest hope for us as a community of faith, as a church family. It's not that others would say, well, you know, those people over at First United Methodist believe the right things about this or that. Uh, they believe this about that, that about this. You know, they've really got it together in terms of their understanding of baptism or communion or some other uh, theological matter. That's not my highest hope. My highest hope for us is that they might say, those people over at First Methodist do what Jesus said to do. And they live the way Jesus said to live. So I said that last Sunday, and then I worked on this week's sermon. And the words that we are dealing with today have helped me to refine that statement a little bit farther. Okay, so here goes. My highest hope is that folks might say, those people over at First United Methodist Church do what Jesus said to do and live like Jesus said to live because they are becoming the way he wants them to be. So that our behavior as Christian disciples is not just something we do grudgingly or because we've put it on a list. We do it willingly because his love and his spirit are alive in us. In today's readings that Amelia Crumpton shared with us earlier, Jesus takes two teachings from his faith tradition and from the Hebrew scriptures, one about murder and the other about adultery, and in both cases, he invites his readers, go deeper. Can a person keep from killing another person and still be filled with hate? Oh, yes. Can a person avoid physical assault of another individual but be working all the time to hurt, destroy, 
another individual. Oh, yeah. Can a person avoid committing adultery but still be consumed with lust and regard others with sexual desire, seeing them only as objects for gratification? Yeah, that can happen. Avoiding physical assault of another individual will keep you out of jail. But if you want to be made well, deal with the underlying issues that cause such behavior. Deal with the sources of the hate, the envy, the resentment, the anger. Avoiding adultery and reckless promiscuity can keep you out of divorce court and help keep you from being a part of a paternity suit. But if you want to be made well, deal with the issues that can make a person a slave to their lower animal nature. Deal with the idea of using people as bodies, regarding them more as bodies than as sacred beings with minds and hearts and souls. Go deeper. Just about 40 years ago, I was one day in the backyard of our then residence, and it was in North Dallas, with our then only child, our daughter Paige. Paige was about, I'm going to say, three and a half, four years old, that sort of thing. And um, together, uh, we were learning about the lawn and weeds and things like that. I was teaching her about getting rid of dandelions in the lawn. Um, and something took place that day, which made me immediately think, there's a lesson in that. I'm going to save that and use it in a sermon sometime. And today I'm happy to report that 40 years later, I'm finally going to use it, okay? But when you write it down, you've got it, right? So I've been waiting, all right? What happened was this. She was eagerly helping me with all my chores around the garage and the yard in the wonderful way that children do when they're that age. Um, I was showing her about carefully gripping the dandelions close to the ground and then gently pulling them out so that you could pull out the roots as well. I showed her how it was done, and then I said, okay, now you try. She took hold of the plant, gave it a jerk, just pulling off the top. I said, no, you have to pull slowly. You have to pull the whole thing out so that you get the roots. She put her hands on her hips and looked at me, and she said in a matter-of-fact way, well, you can't see it anymore. <laughs> and isn't that the way that I sometimes deal with my sin? Isn't that the way we all deal with some of the things that we're not too proud of? We learn to hide them. We learn to control. I've learned to bite my tongue. I've learned not to say what I'm thinking. But down deep, the roots that give rise to those things are still there. In such a case, have we been made well? Or have we just learned to cover up evidence of what still may be growing? God offers us grace and mercy for a reason. This is important. The reason is that so that God can begin and continue the process of changing us deep down. One of the more famous and insightful theological understandings of John Wesley was his understanding of how God's grace works and what it accomplishes. He's famous for coming up with the three modes or movements of God's grace. Um, they, these are called prevenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace. Prevenient grace is the grace of God that comes before. The word prevenient comes from the Latin pre-venere, which means coming before. This is the grace of God that is always reaching toward us from the moment we are born. 
It is extended toward us and reaches toward us not because of who we are. This is because of who God is. This is what we affirm in the sacrament of Christian baptism. Infant baptism is not the same as believer's baptism. But we do affirm God's grace is already reaching toward that child. And God loves this child as much as God will ever love this child. If this child one day decides to become a Christian and to receive this grace and to become an ordained minister and the leader of a great congregation and accomplish some great thing for God, God will not love this child any more after any of those accomplishments than God loves this child right now. Prevenient grace. And then he spoke about justifying grace. This is when we recognize, receive, sort of understand, want to be a part of God's grace in Jesus Christ. This is when we respond to the grace that has been there all along. This is the moment of what we would call believer's baptism or becoming a Christian. We're put right with God through forgiveness of all our past sins, and we begin a living relationship with God, but you're still not finished. Unfortunately, a lot of folks have given or gotten the impression that that's the goal. Let's get you down the aisle. Let's get you baptized. Let's get you forgiven. Okay. You're done. Wesley said, you're not done. Wesley teaches about the continuing work of grace that he called sanctifying grace. Sanctification comes from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy. And God's sanctifying grace continues to work in us, on us, through us, to make us more holy with the passing of time. The process of sanctification should never end as long as we are alive. But if we stop before we continue this lifelong process, we cheat ourselves of the joy of forever growing toward the image and example of Christ. Do you want to be made well? If so, may I suggest that it might be good to let God deal with all of you? The rest of you, the hidden parts, the shameful parts, the embarrassing parts, the chronic parts, let God keep working on you and me. Let's become willing to learn and continue to learn and change and grow, not just in terms of our outward behavior, but in terms of the motives, the inward, the spiritual. God wants us to go all in in terms of the healing God wants, us to, God wants to provide to us. You know, Jesus was known as a teacher, a rabbi. He was tone, known as a miracle worker. And he was also known as a healer. In our awkwardness in dealing with how God works, we've sometimes been a little shy about talking of Jesus as a healer. But Jesus was a healer. Now, you can get a little weird out there if you start following some of the people who think they've got Jesus and God's healing figured out. You know, name it, claim it. I'm going to pray it. going to get my prayer warriors to do battle with God, you know, to uh, pray for this thing and make it happen, cure my disease. It can get a little weird. But I think we've sometimes forgotten or downplayed that last part of Jesus being a healer, not all of the healing God works in our lives happens in instantaneous, miraculous fashion. I'm looking at a couple of point people right here that I know have been diagnosed with cancer. But they've since been declared cancer-free. The healing didn't take place overnight. It was a process. Sometimes a very difficult and challenging process, a sickening process, chemotherapy, radiation. Sometimes they got sicker than when they first started that journey. That's what it's sometimes like when we allow God to reach into the deeper parts of ourselves. But that's where true and lasting transformation takes place. 
And I, I'll go as far as to say, I don't think it's too much to say that until we go all in, allowing God to deal with us deep down, there can remain cancers of envy and anger and fear and self-hatred and prejudice and closed-minded that live just under the skin. They may not be seen, they may not be heard in our words or our actions, but they can poison our hearts and our minds and our soul. If you want to be made well, we should go all in with allowing God to touch those parts of us that are in need of that healing touch. Let me just ask you a question, then I'll get to close the sermon, okay? When you're aware of a sin or a problem in your life, maybe a repetitive sin or weakness, do you pray that God will just make you stop doing the thing? Or are you willing to let God deal with the underlying issue? You know, sometimes those sins, weaknesses, and failures are repetitive and chronic because we haven't let God speak to us or perform the inner spiritual surgery needed to get at the roots so that they are like a dandelion that keeps returning until those roots are dealt with. There's a story from the ministry of the Reverend Dr. G. Campbell Morgan. He was a, a Salvation Army pastor, a preacher in London. Um, it was from an earlier generation, probably 120 years ago or so. Um, I, I told the story in a sermon a year and a half ago, but it fits well with today's sermon, so I'm going to tell it again, and besides that, I count on you for, to forget stuff. Okay. Word came to Dr. Morgan one day that a woman in the community was in dire circumstances. She was a widow. She had three young children. She'd run out of money. There was no food in the house. They were about to be evicted from their home. Dr. Morgan told his congregation at, uh, at Westminster Chapel about this need. He didn't reveal the woman's name. He simply described the situation and uh, asked for them to take up a special offering to help her through. Uh, the people were very generous. They were touched to their hearts and responded in wonderful ways. Dr. Morgan was so proud of his congregation's general resp generous response, uh, he couldn't wait to get over to this woman's house. So after church was over and he'd locked up the vestry and, and uh, the church building, um, he went right over to the woman's house so that he could give her this money to, so that she could keep a roof over her head, provide food for her children. Um, when he got to her house, he knocked on her door, but no one answered. Um, he thought maybe they were in a different part of the house, so he went around back and he knocked, no answer. He even shouted through the glass on the side of the house, still no response. Well, he was disappointed. He'd been so excited to share this wonderful gift with this woman, so he went home. But later that afternoon, the widow herself came to his house. Someone else had come by, someone who had been able to figure out that the offering was for this friend of theirs. And she had told them, she had told the widow what the congregation had done and that Dr. Morgan had come to her house. She went to Dr. Morgan's door, knocked on it, and when he opened, she said, Oh, Dr. Morgan, I'm so sorry. I was inside the house all the time. I heard you knocking. I heard you calling. I told my children not to answer the door because I was afraid. I was afraid that you were the landlord coming to collect the rent when, after all, you were a friend coming to bring a precious gift. We sometimes fear what might be exposed. 
what ancient pains and traumas we may have to recall. Or even facing the words of truth about what we've done, how we've been, if we were to allow God into the deep wounds and hurts and secret places of our lives. But always, God comes as a friend. Always God comes to provide help and healing. May we never fear to let him in. Let's pray together. O oh God, our helper and our healer, give us courage and faith in you so that we might allow you to touch us, even in those places where we've tried to hide and cover up and ignore. Show us those parts of ourselves we've tried to hold on to, but know that you'd like us to let go of. Thank you, O oh God, for wanting good for us. In the coming days, may we allow your Holy Spirit to gently uncover any and all places in us that you want to deal with. For we do trust in you. And pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we leave this place, what is our mission? To make, to make disciples, disciples of Jesus Christ, Christ for the, the transformation, transformation of, of the world.
three b brief announcements to share with you. The first um, is in relation to the card, which I hope you get in, got in your printed order of worship. Down the hall in our modern worship, there's a group of youth and adults who are preparing to leave town this afternoon to be engaged in a week of mission work on behalf of others. They'll be building accessibility ramps for those who need them and cannot afford them. So I want to simply want to invite your uh, spiritual participation in this trip. So many of you have been generous already in helping support them monetarily, economically, but I, I, want, you to, I want you to be connected to them uh, during this week as you pray for them. Th these are just a couple of suggestions that might guide your prayers, but let's remember them and let's celebrate their commitment to Christ and how they are representing us and him as they are away from us down in the Austin area. Uh, the next is a simple, quick poll, and I do want a response if you'd be willing. How many of you walk for exercise? Okay. How about let's walk together next Saturday morning, okay? Next Saturday morning is the, uh, is the uh, annual Juneteenth par parade. It's not on Juneteenth, but uh, at, beginning at 10 o'clock a.m. at the Af Ellis County African American History Museum. Um, I'll be there. I know others of our congregation. I think it's good for us to join in uh, with our African American brothers and sisters and all lovers of liberty to celebrate Juneteenth next Saturday, 10 o'clock p.m. And finally, don't forget, next Sunday is Father's Day. If you haven't gotten a card, get one, okay? Um, and uh, if you're a dad or if you had a dad, I hope that you will be in worship to give thanks for the gift that fatherhood is and to give thanks to God for either um, the wonderful dad that, uh, that you received or for giving you the strength to make it through the parenting that you received from your dad. Both are appropriate. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Let's look to the um, responsive benediction for today. As we depart, let's recall and give thanks for who goes with us. The Lord, the giver of life and healing, is with us. May we welcome God's guidance and help in all our ways. The peace of God remain with you always and also with you. Amen.